Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us again. Another episode of the Roses and Rhetoric podcast. Today, today joining us, actually, a very special guest, Jack Ernest, who is a uh, fan of the podcast, friend of the podcast, and co-host of his own podcast called The World's Best Podcast, hosted by himself and Reno. Jack, thank you for joining us today. We have a lot in store. Take it away. What's up, guys? I'm very happy to be here. I had Joe on a few weeks ago. It was a good time. Um, yeah, so you guys making me come up with some content for the show. Well, I have some content for you guys. It's good. Okay. And it's in the form of a power present point presentation, kind of, except for it's just pictures of whiteboard I, I drew on the, the uh, original PowerPoint as it were the original PowerPoint. If I had enough money for an assistant, I might have them uh, convert it to just, PowerPoint for me, right. but I don't have that kind of dough. So <laughs> Wait, hang on jack before you get started on your powerpoint why don't you why don't you give us a little background on on yourself let's do that so i am 25 years old i graduated oregon state degree in mechanical engineering i was working in the construction world now i'm shifting over probably well actually that is why um so i left that industry and that kind of inspired this presentation that i'm created that i created for you guys today and because I've been brainstorming with like in today's world with how much leverage you have as an individual, like with social media, with uh, just, I mean, just act, the fact that you can talk to every single person on the planet, like, and don't have to be a famous person or anything like that. I was like, how can you leverage your kind of worldview to uh, generate revenue for yourself? That's something like outside of maybe a traditional paid position. So that's been something that's been on, on my mind for like the last month or so. Um, and then this weekend or last week, I was kind of like inspired to put this together just to help me organize my thoughts. And I, I haven't, I've explained it to a couple of people and it seems like it goes well, but you guys will have to tell me if it makes any sense or not. And just like, no, no, if it doesn't make sense, you guys let me know, but I think it'll still prompt some good discussion. No, I, I think so too. And, and in fact, I mean, this sounds like this is building off of an idea that Joe and I have talked before, which is this idea of, you know, have we really come to grips with what the internet really means for how people pursue money, employment, making money, et cetera. Uh, and just kind of from your general overline so far, I think you're going to touch on some topics that uh, actually one of the, one of the many things, but this is definitely one of them that uh, I think really Joe had to convince me of uh, was, Hey, there's this internet world out there and you need to get your ass in gear and be a part of it. And I resisted for a long time, but uh, I have to say one of, one of many examples where I think Joe ended up being proven right. And uh, I think playing well off of the content that you'll be sharing with us uh, today. I think that's exactly correct. And yeah, I think we're going to be on the same wavelength here. Great. Jack, before we get started, I have one question for you, which is uh, who is your Super Bowl pick? So I walked into a situation yesterday where I uh, was talking to somebody who revealed to me they'd hit four out of five legs of a parlay. Do you bet? Do you know what a parlay? Like, yeah. You know that is. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, is you, I have seen uncut gems, so I know what a parlay is. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Great he's movie. hit four out of five legs. The fifth legs is he's got the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. If he hits that, he's going to win $4,500. So I said yesterday, because we were wine tasting for mom's birthday, I said, why don't I hedge that for you? Because you don't, he didn't have access to the like the Kansas Chiefs plus one and a half might like mine. I don't know if, if you bet this all makes a lot of uh, sense. Sure, sure, if sure. Don't bet. It sounds like nonsense. So I, I was able to walk into 10% commission. And so I win money no matter what today. Either nice. I win 150, 300, or $600, long story short. But I win the most money if Tom Brady's has 300 yard yards very good well we i think so i would say i want the i want i like the bucks i want the bucks by one point that's the best situation for me is the bucks by exactly one point yeah i i think everybody wants tom brady to do well i mean at least let me put it i know no way i i hope everybody wants tom brady to do well i mean the guy's a superstar athlete a phenomenal uh quarterback and it's always fun to see the goat in their natural habitat and uh hopefully brady has a good game today I, I think he will. He's, he's, uh, he's been around the block once or twice, but Mahomes is pretty, 
pretty fucking good too. Yeah, a lot, a lot of good teams. Well, Jack, I, I want to get to your presentation because I think there's a lot of interesting content. So when when you're ready, we're gonna try a, a new thing on the Rose Runner podcast: sharing a screen, and uh, we will see how well this works. So uh, Jack, let's see how it goes. Yeah. Here we go. All right, can you guys see that? Yes. So we are looking right now. It says how you make money. So Jack, when you're right. That's that is correct. So <laughs> this is uh this is basically how I organize my thoughts. Okay. So I uh been I bought a whiteboard probably five years ago and I just like I'll go to town on it sometimes. And then uh I've actually seen Joe do it once or twice too. And so I kind of uh got some inspiration some of the way he formatted his and Scott Adams as well. He likes the whiteboard and there's some good content there. So anyway, basically I was looking at, um, my biggest problem with money was I felt like no matter what I was super limited as long as I was trading for my time. And so what do, what do I mean by that? It's like, well, really the only commodity that you can trade is time. Right. And, but you can become more efficient in producing things and then like make like, like, um, try to create like maximize that efficiency in order to make the most dollars per unit of time i know you guys are both engineers so that is something that will make a lot of sense to you uh so i just you know wrote down the three things what are trading your time i brought down hourly job uh, being a lawyer that one was kind of a joke because everyone ever in my advice like whenever i've thought i've said i've thought about going to law school and everyone said don't do it you're going to be trading your time but then i was like aren't you trading your time with a salary job too because you are but they get more, but even in a salary job, they even get more say in how much time they can take from you, but for the same amount of pay. So your employer can just be like, I'm, we need 20 extra hours from you this week. Your pay doesn't change though. We're just taking 20 extra hours. And so I just, I, I fundamentally don't like that. And it feels like that's not the only way to generate revenue in 2020 because we have access to the internet. And so whatever, like, when I had my salary job, right, I was making really good money and I was being productive two hours a day. And then I penciled out, right? Like I was a net positive on paper for the company. So if they can find a role for me where I'm worth X amount of dollars for two hours a day, it's like, how much money could I make if I was producing value and benefiting off my work directly rather than somebody else? But the second part of that equation is how do you create something that will allow for a source of revenue, right? Because like, that's the advantage of working in a company is they've already developed a role for me that I, that would be really difficult for me to develop on myself to like, you know, generate the same amount of value. So the other side of that is, uh, well, there's two other sides. One is investments, which I kind of put in its own category. Uh, that, I think it's the easiest way to make long-term cash. And it's because you have, you know, $5 million in the bank. Uh, the way I understand the stock market and S&P is S&P is just going up forever. You can live off that interest and if you have enough cash in the bank you're good to go and just like live below whatever you're generating an in interest but i don't have that much cash so that's not really an option until i generate cash in the first place right uh, so second is or the last thing is to trade directly for goods and services with no time unit involved and the number one thing there that i was thinking of is content so if you write a book you write a book one time and you can generate royalties on the book until people stop reading the book or you know if you're write a one-hit wonder song right um so that is sort of this first slide and then i'm gonna what i'm gonna what i'm gonna bring in next on this next slide is how your worldview impacts the way you're able to make money kind of through this uh no time involved like, like situation because that seems like the best if i can generate something that just is constantly producing revenue that seems like the best way to make money even i mean it's really difficult but like just trying to create this frame so that way i can help helps me spot opportunities in the real world like yesterday when i helped hedge the bet <laughs> right right took 20 minutes of work and i'm gonna make 400 dollars <laughs> very good very good oh, yeah. Um, so yeah so off to the world view slide to the world view slide Worldview, can you see that or is the Zoom yes. thing in the way? No, that is, the, that, that is working for us. Okay. 
so you can see I have the table of contents at the top left too, just to let you know what, what's coming, what's coming next. PowerPoint in a, the most archaic fashion. So your worldview, what is your worldview? This is kind of a pivot. So let's define that. So uh, Scott Adams, who I'm a huge fan of, this would kind of describe this as your uh, reality filter, right? And so you got, I got the picture. Can you see my mouse? Yes, yep. yes. So you can see I got my the I drew my glasses, right? And this 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 glasses is like you're looking through the worldview of the lens of Christianity. And this one says you're looking at the world like you're in a movie. Like you just think everything is a movie, right? Like maybe you're think you live on the Truman show or something. But essentially it's just like a different lens that you put on the world. And so this kind of gets into the question is like, well. What, why is that important? Well, I would argue that your worldview at any given instant, right? Like it's constantly changing and it's almost your primary factor, like driver in decision-making. And it's not necessarily something that you can always control, but there's certainly sometimes you can. And I would, this kind of goes back to like, um, this gets a little bit more philosophical, but you know, you talk about the duality of man where you have this like primal instinct, uh, you know, sex, food, alcohol partying and then you also have this like second part of you that's able to think longer term and make decisions based on more than just immediate gratification and uh these so sometimes like uh for instance i was uh i was i was i was hooked on the zins for a little bit you guys know what the zins are they're like nicotine pouches oh I, they're no, like chew but they're like they're so like, like copenhagen light yeah, exactly. And so I started noticing, like, sometimes, like, I was, like, just absolutely not in control of my decision making. Like, so, like, I'd be having a lazy day. But the next thing you know, I'd literally be at the gas station buying a pack of Zins, like, with no even recollect, like, just, I wasn't even present. Like, it was just this physical force of me wanting the nicotine brought me all the way to the store before I even became conscious of what I was doing. Um, but then, like, you know, then I, uh, but that's not always the case. I was able to pretty much stop those because of making this longer term thinking um, and just changing my perspective on what those are doing. Like primarily, I was like, okay, well, what, what's the number one? I want to be gaining weight. This is hurting gaining weight. So I started to associate it with gaining weight and boom, I stopped like automatically having that habit. So how does this relate to making, uh, relate to making money? Well, I've been thinking about it a lot because of the podcast and we're going to uh, go into the next slide here. In just a second, which I'll show you like how this applies to the construction business where I was, but I'm going to mention the podcast first. Um, and part of what I've noticed that you guys have done a really good job on that we've been struggling with is there's like this, uh, there's a psychological barrier I have in a marketing, you know, because some of it I think is fear of like how people are going to judge me, um, how comfortable I am like reaching out to somebody like, I know you guys have, you guys have that Nobel Peace Prize on winner last week it's a tough act to follow or two weeks ago maybe it was uh and i was like that is amazing that you guys are getting that on and it helped me recognize like i was having this limiting belief that nobody would want to do that for our show but it was that's not true like that's just that's that's me creating a rule in my head because of some backwards world worldview that doesn't actually make sense but it's still a driver in my decision making so that limiting belief is like preventing me from making money on the podcast, like not to write that and other things, but that would be one of. Okay. So the last, so here's slide three and I do not have a slide uh, four for other worldviews. We'll just talk about that. Uh, but how a construction business makes money. So there's two types of, right. So there's going to have two types of construction business. One, you're going to have like a corporation, which is where I was working, or you might have an individual general contractor. And so basically what they do is they're not necessarily the builder themselves, but like, if you're just an individual, you just gather all the subcontractors that would to complete all the appropriate scopes of work. So, uh, you know, uh, individual is going to build a building, they're going to collect their fee, and then they're going to organize and pay the subcontractors. And so the only profit that they put in, there's more cash flow there items, but really the only profit that they put in their pocket is whatever this contractor's fee is. So how does that affect like their decision-making and their incentives um, and how they're essentially generating value? Well, primarily, if you get, if you like are looking, like if the incentives there are going to be to 
build the building as fast as possible with the best subcontractors that are providing the cheapest price. However, if you shift to the corporation side, um, they do the same thing where they build a building, collect the fee and pay the subcontractors, but they have these other components, right? So like they have this office pay, they have overhead, uh, they have subsidiary uh, subcontractors. So like the company I was at, you know, we had a, 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 we owned our like own concrete business and we did a lot of our own work and we were the best at it too. So like makes sense to hire them. But if you look at the incentives there, it's like now you necess- aren't necessarily making the most money by just uh, profiting, right? So this is basically saying how your worldview changes as a corporation compared to an individual and therefore your incentives change. And then so like, how does that affect the consumer and how does that affect how you're approaching making money? Because for the corporation side, they make money every single week there on the project because that is directly how the, the salaries go to their employees and to the paying overhead costs for the office. Uh, and they're also making money off the subsidiary subcontractors that, that they're paying. But if you're an individual, your salary is caked into the fee, right? So you don't gain any additional cash by extending the project. Um, and so basically... Uh, I'm just, I'm arguing that right there in the middle, it says the, the difference in de- like the difference in decision-making is a result of a variance in incentives. So in other words, it's just like, you just have different worldviews because of the way the company is sh- structured and set up. And so I'm saying this is one example in the construction world that can like, it's just, it just to show you how your worldview can change your decision-making and that this is something that you can, I'm making the claim that you can actively choose to do this in whatever endeavor you choose to pursue. Yeah. And I, oh, go ahead, Jack. Sorry. And uh, that is, and then, the, and then the last slide, which I want to talk about you guys is like, just bringing up the, or like, that was just in the, which I don't know, leading discussion, but like, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So that this, the other world view thing applies to every decision making like factor in your life. And that doesn't just include uh, monetary things. It's like choosing to go to the gym, right? Mm-hmm. If you, even if you hate it, like that sort of thing too. Hopefully this makes sense because this has been in my brain for like months and right. this is the best I can put it out there, but it's been really hard for me to try to like put this concept into words that other people can understand. Sure. No, I, I, I think this looks really good. Let's, let me, let me kind of start the conversation going back to a point you made earlier, which I think is definitely a point that Joe and I have talked about ourselves. And I think plays a lot into the world of persuasion. And it's the way that we create rules for ourselves that ultimately don't have any logical basis that are essentially uh, holding us back in all sorts of funny ways. You, you, you mentioned um, limiting beliefs and that, you know, those are the rules that I'm talking about here. Where, where do you see these rules coming from? And what should people be doing to challenge these rules in their own life? Okay, so these rules are, well, this goes back to like nature versus nurture, right? I would say some of the rules are things that you're just born with, right? There's some worldviews that you're going to act on. Like, for instance, I did a, I did a 30-hour fast a couple of days ago. I was trying to go for 72 hours. I physically could not make it because my body, I like, I could not fight the hunger enough and I just gave into it, right? That's just physio, physio, physiological. My mind space could not leave food, right? But then there's other ones like, you know, I put before like Christianity, right? So while I personally think that Christianity is a good value structure and of like, you know, if you're to like choose among all of them, it's a really good one. If you were born with it and you haven't ever looked around it's like you have to be able to recognize the fact that many people get along without christianity just fine and do very very well so that would be one example of like just a like a limiting belief for mental prison is like that your religion is the only one that could possibly be correct and you will be stuck in the world until you go well maybe this isn't the only way right and you're and you're never going to be able to break out of that until you start asking those questions which can be really hard but uh, it goes down to other things like uh, even like manners, for example. Manners are just, you know, societal rules that we all follow. But, uh, um, and sometimes there's can be a lot of advantage to being rude or overbearing. Like, for instance, if uh, um, you're at a restaurant and they don't 
give you the right food. Well, if you can be really polite and eat the shitty meal, or you can be kind of rude and probably get your meal for free. And you know, that's not necessarily, you might not want to do that, but like, if you say I follow manners all the time, you'll never even have the choice. And so kind of it's recognizing that these barriers exist and doesn't necessarily mean you need to like break the rules of them all the time. But just if you recognize that you're able to break the rules, you can apply those in uh, a lot of different situations that just applies to literally every aspect of your life all day. Yeah. I like that. I like the idea of that term, the, the false prison or the mental prison. And with respect mm-hmm. to how you can hypnotize yourself essentially into believing something that's completely not true. Like you just have these beliefs that are there that just hold you back. They really serve no, no, no merit in your, in your life path. And I'm constantly reminded of this line from Tim Ferriss every time I think of mental prisons. And it's, I don't remember the exact quote, but it goes something along the lines of, unless it's at odds with the hard rule of physics, everything else is negotiable. Like every mindset's negotiable. Like, and that kind of goes along. I know Jimmy and I have discussed before, like Matthew McConaughey, like when he was growing up, his parents specifically forced him to not use the word can't growing up just so that that's that just limits the amount of uh, self prisons or mental prisons that you can put yourself in. Um, and I want to go back, you were talking about how it's not a very good value investment to trade your time for money. And I think you were hinting at that it might be a better uh, strategy to earn with your mind instead of your time. That seems to be where this where, where this uh, I like that. Is going. I like that sentence. <laughs> Yeah. Can you, can you elaborate more on that or like give, provide some alternatives for what might be possible as opposed to the status quo um, job structure as it is today? Hmm. So I don't think trading your time is necessarily a bad thing. And actually I had this conversation. uh, I've got a good friend. He's a uh, partner at Stoll Reeves. He's an attorney. And so I was bringing up the, this to him last night and uh, you know, very successful lawyer and he was talking about how he struggles with that exact same concept of as a lawyer that you're just constantly trading your time. And so you're wanting to build more hours. And so he goes, that's not really, he, cause he was making the argument. It's not really the case. He's like, cause I can make um, like where I saw it, see an advantage is I can draft one perfect contract for a company. And then now I can sell that contract to other companies that are in similar industries. And it takes me one tenth of the time, but I can still build the same amount of hours. And so I was like, oh shit, that's, that is content production more or less. Right. So you're taking, now that would be a way of taking something that was hourly and turning it into something that's content and transferable, which like, okay, it's like you said, making money with your mind and not your time. It's like by drafting that content and like putting his mind into it, it's like now he just has something tangible, t- tangible that he can transfer from company to company. Uh, and the other thing is with hourly jobs as well, like if you're just willing to trade your time for X number of years and save, you could use that investments block and like eventually leave this and have more freedom. I guess, I guess the biggest thing is freedom, right? So like, the less hours you need to spend to make your dollars, the more freedom and choices you have in the world. And so that's really the biggest thing. And so trading your time can be an efficient way to get there. Um, but it's just, you know, you're always going to be limited as compared to if you produce content, it's you're no longer having to sacrifice your time for incremental revenue. Yeah. And, and Jack, I, I, I really, I, to me, I'm, I'm drawn to your conversation over, over content production and, and product production. I, I am very much persuaded that, you know, one of the, the key things that we should encourage more people to do is to uh, explore ways that they can create things and produce things. And whether that's somebody creating as an engineer or an artist or a podcast or a book, you know, whatever the, whatever the end product is, I really think that we don't do enough in our society right now, encouraging people to try production and, uh, and in some ways, I, I kind of view that as like kind of this, there's still this secret around the internet and around computers that in, in some ways, even though they've been around for a long time, are, are still incredibly underutilized. And I think a lot of it is people's fear of rejection, fear of not making it big, fear of not becoming, you know, the next great American novelist or whatever it may be. But you won't know unless you try. And it's never been easier to try. 
I mean, those two things I think are fundamentally true that a yeah. computer in the internet, anybody who wants to write a book, write a book. Just maybe three weeks ago, we had on our podcast, Dr. Phil Lacovara. His background wasn't in writing. His background wasn't being an author. His background was, you know, PhD in physics. And yeah, he wrote a book. I mean, that is possible today in a way that it was not possible in the past. And part of what we try and do on this podcast is basically saying, look, we really think that people should explore creativity. To, to, to Joe's point on our first episode of the podcast, there will never be another you. Therefore, in a sense, you almost owe it to society to try to create something that could only have ever come from you. And I, I think your point on content production, the fact that that has value or has potential for value, it, I think is, it, if anything, reinforces that idea that we ought to be encouraging people to pursue these creative avenues. Um, I lost connection there for like two seconds, <laughs> but it was like my computer started telling my connection was unstable, but it looks like we're back. Well, I agree. But so basically I make sure I didn't miss anything. So, so you're just saying like, yeah, now you don't know to, unless you try, we now all have access to it. This isn't something that's just like the wealthy elite. Like, I mean, I look at my podcast setup that I've got an HD camera, good microphone that uh, in like the whole setup was under like $80. It was like a 80 or a hundred dollars to get all my equipment. And then like, I, then I, then you like you get the free podcast platform app and you're paying next to nothing. You know what I mean? For being able to access the whole world. It's unbelievable. So here's my big theory and claim. This is the biggest claim that I'm going to make right now. What I think the future is going because of all this is that I think that the future is going to be a lot more self-employed individuals, like eventually close to everybody. Um, I think that automation and robotics will essentially fulfill the roles that corporations have their employees doing, like even to more complicated tasks. But if you are, you know, have a more optimistic view of that, what that does is that frees up everybody's time to just like start producing content and adding and just like generating value in other ways beyond basic needs, right? Like we're pretty close to a time where we can pretty much meet everybody's basic needs without a ton of user input, right? And that's definitely within the future that we could automate just like food, building processes, water. And so we can need to start, I think that needs to start rethinking about how we um, as individuals are able to generate value for society mm -hmm. uh, to earn freedom and choices ourselves because it can't like, because I also don't I think that like everyone should just have everything handed to them. Like you need to contribute, right? We need people contributing because otherwise the world's going to not be a fun place. <laughs> yeah, Jack, I, I like that point about how it's not only just a nice to have of productizing yourself essentially and getting away from reliance on big companies to make money, but it's almost a necessity because if they can train you to do it, then they will eventually train a computer to do it, right? So just in terms of job security, it's, it's a better value proposition to, to productize yourself. Um, now, yeah, and then going back to what Jim was saying, like, I think that is a powerful idea that if we can, if we can enable the individuals to make more businesses, uh, the individuals are always going to be successful because no one can compete with you on being you. So a better place to put your effort would be into yourself because the better you get, the better your product gets, and it can increase um, exponentially. You can compound that experience. Um, now, how, what, what, what's your thoughts on, on, uh, on how, how soon these computers are gonna be taking over jobs? Like we were talking about the construction industry earlier uh, do you think there's some aspects of that that are forever going to rely in the hands of humans? Or do you think that, have you seen indications that that's all going away? Oh, in the construction world, like, I mean, as far as the laborers and stuff, that's not going away anytime soon. I mean, that's, it, there's just like what the human body can do. You would have to get such specialized machinery to just like perform some of these tasks where you just like you have one human perform like a hundred of them, you know? So it's like, I don't see us at a level of robotics where it's like that's happening anytime soon. And in robotics too, I mean, I, 
was mechanical engineering, took intelligent robots, like as a 500 level elective class, like something that's not like, I'm not confused on what the like limitations of what robotics are, right? And their expenses. So for as far as construction goes, that's not anytime soon. But what the jobs that are more in danger would be like the office roles, I think at the uh, construction company, because a lot of it is, um, a lot of it is like managing paperwork, doing takeoffs uh, based on, you know, digital drawings. And it's like, you can, in a, what a takeoff, I don't know, sorry, it's the term I should define, but takeoff essentially is just like, you know, if you're doing a door takeoff, you're just counting how many doors are in the building and then sending it to the door company and getting a price for doors. Or if you're figuring out, if you got pouring a concrete slab, how much concrete you need to purchase and pour. Like that's, you're just, you know, you're just going on the digital drawing and taking it off. And it's like you, that to me seems like, well, that's something that you could for sure get software to do, right? You don't need, you know, wouldn't need a person. And that's like a huge part of what people in the office are doing. So I actually think even though they're the higher educated people, the people whose jobs are more at risk are not the trades people on the ground floor, but, um, it seems like the office workers to me, uh, but the, you know, the silver lining to that is they're also really smart, creative people that I think, you know, I would a lot, I would rather see a lot of them doing their own thing anyway. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but you also want to be able to provide an avenue, which is we're getting there, right? Cause everyone's got this access, but you, you need to get people out of this mental prison that they need a company to make their cash because it's, we are leaving that rapidly and it's already happening. And you see people, uh, all over the starting to do it. I mean, OnlyFans is a great example. I mean, the, I know that's like a w- weird one, but it's like, there's girls that are like, that are, if they're business minded properly, you know, they're taking naked photos and just generating 20, $30,000 a month. And now it doesn't, I think, I think that that model is going to move far beyond like pornography and into our entire world. Right. Um, and you see Scott Adams do it on locals where he's like, and the, where he's like, oh yeah, it's just, it's a cheap fee, but what, but by having a fee to you to, for you to watch my show here, now we have a platform for discussion and it eliminates all of the trolls. And it is really, it's like a bunch of random people that you don't know their qualifications, but the discussion on his locals page is really amazing because of that. And so just the potential for good ideas to be spread and good thinkers to get together and produce content is just like without needing these corporations or these like higher entities i mean it's here it's happening i think before our eyes and it's like i want to be on that wave yeah, yeah. My, my my concern with that is that society is pushing people down this college pipeline that gives them very specific jobs that are very specific educations that apply to very specific jobs and it doesn't give a whole lot of room for for exploring alternatives like like only fans, as you discussed earlier. Um, <laughs> I, I, it's a funny example, but it, it is, that is the, that is the model for a lot of industries. Yeah. Joe and In I will be starting the only fans page any day now, and you should check us out on the only fans as well. Oh, I'll, ch- I'll check it out. <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned. Um, but my, my, my question is what it, the government is just pushing more and more people to go to college and to rack up these student loans. And now they're even starting to, uh, advocate uh, erasing these student loans too, making it even more attractive for people to go to college and go down this pipeline. So is it, I mean, what's your take on that? Is that just like, okay, that just makes my job easier because all these other people are going down this pipeline and that just makes me more, uh, more, you know, secluded, more advantageous, or do you think it's bad for just society as a whole to be heading in that direction? Uh, so, hmm. I think that the college thing will be driven to irrelevancy and here's why. So like, I, I, okay, so let's, let's okay, get a couple parts of your question. One, do I think it's bad if, or do I think it's an advantage that like, I'm the only one doing this? No, I think that's, I think that's worse. I think if you have more people doing this, it creates more opportunity for collaboration. And um, I don't think it's a zero sum game as far as content production goes um i think that there's a lot of deals that can be made with just a ton of surplus on both ends of uh you know new producers coming out like you guys having this podcast for example right uh, i'm i'll be plugging you guys on my podcast i i'm getting plugged here we are both getting more followers than we would have if only one of us existed 
right? And so I think that I think that applies to most creative endeavors. Uh, so I'm in full support of just more people. I want more competition. That's 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 good. It, it, and it also just brings more attention over here. Um, there's not a limit to. I don't. I think that there's. It's. I just don't. I just don't view it as a zero sum game in that way. But the reason I think college will be obsolete is because I think that the education system will be taken over the same way these other industries will, is that you will have free online education that matches the caliber of any school. And why the hell would you pay $4,000 in tuition when you can have on your laptop for maybe $20 a month, subscribe to somebody that's going to teach you the exact skills that you want. Um, and, you know, I've, uh, I've actually thought about how if I made my own online college, uh, I'd, yeah, essentially just have like, Hey, we will give you these certifications, just like literally pass these courses that we'll run through and you can do them at your own time on your own pace. Um, and you know, you can just take courses without the intent of getting a degree either. Like, it's just, this is like a purely educational platform and you can learn anything from skills to, uh, calculus to history and, but you don't need to have a professor sitting up there for every lecture. They can record a lecture and then everybody can watch it. It's the same, like you don't need that one hour spent by the professor every single day. You just don't. You need them to do it for one term and then you record every lecture and then you have people watch the videos. People don't ask questions in lectures that much. Like you might need some tutors on the side, but like generally if you can just watch the lecture, you're getting all the content as you would if you were sitting there in person. And so I just don't see how the college model will be able to keep up uh, just from an economic perspective with the online world as it continues to improve. Yeah, so I, I think it's a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, just, I largely agree with you. I was gonna say for me, my my biggest concern is not, I, I, I think the, the quality of material online is actually quite good right now. I think yeah. the challenge is that people will, or at least say currently, I don't, I don't think there is a stigma against online education or you know self-taught for example i mean it still means a lot to have uh, an ivy league school you know behind your name it still means a lot to have a college degree just in terms of employment and so there's like this weird shifting period where i certainly agree with you i hope the future is more not only that college is more distributed but that people use that to essentially learn their entire lives not just okay go to college for mm -hmm. four years put that in a shelf. We did the education thing. Now we're doing the working thing. I think people would, I think, I, I think get more out of it if it was over a longer period of time, if they could revisit things, if they could learn new things, but the, the challenge is going to be getting people and it really accompanies in, in a sense to take a risk on employing people who don't have, you know, traditional four-year degrees, give them a chance to prove that they're as capable as anybody else in certain aspects of the job and then erode the stigma against either autodidactic people who teach themselves or people who, you know, took something online and, and got a certificate. I think that there's still a, to me, the, the great barrier is that stigma against that mode of education that hopefully goes away with time as more and more people pursue that instead of, you know, the four-year college or, you know, whatever else they're, they're doing. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's exactly correct. Uh, it's, 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 I mean, I think that the college degree thing, it's, it's, it's saturated. I mean, you just, there's so many degrees out there that I'm like, why are you spending four years getting this degree? And then you're going to go like into an industry that's not even related. And I know I'm, I'm actually kind of doing that with like engineering into sales, but again, it's like, but, well, I mean, but I would, I would, I consider my route a little bit different because I just think engineering is I always plug engineering as a degree because it changes how you think about the world and in a very positive way it was my own experience. And I think it applies to any industry. Baseline education. Yeah. For, yeah. For it like is the spectrum. most, exactly. You just yeah. give yourself all the opportunities to do engineering, but there's other like really specific, well, anything that ends in like just generally studies or anything like that. Like not that those things aren't valuable to like learn about, but you college is an investment. So you need to think about your economic return at the end of the day. And for most people, you could get way more return. Fucking, I like I've worked with carpenters that are, you know, our age, making eighty five thousand dollars a year with no debt, and uh, just like uh, they've got like uh, two houses, a rental house. Like one guy was like had three hundred head of cattle that he ran out of, out of his place, and he's like, yeah, I'm pretty much ready to tire. He's like, he's like twenty years old. He's like, yeah, I'm pretty much ready to tire because of these this cattle in like three years. Um, I should be generating like 80, 90 k a year in revenue. It's like he's retiring at 31 
and never went to college and just like got dirty of his hands and knees and fucking ran carpenter. It, that's, that's a great route. And he's providing so much value to society. Like he did really, really good work that helps a lot of people. And so this college, the college thing is like, it's, it's, it's like, what, do you, what are we, this is not the best way to create productive people for society is my opinion. I don't know what's better. Well, the online thing is better, but it's, it's a, uh, I don't think it holds. I don't think long-term um, we're going to continue down this route of shoving everybody into college. I think that people will wake up. I, yeah, I think you are right. I want let's, let, let's shift a little bit to worldview. Cause I think that's kind of the, the, the bigger kind of message here and kind of the bigger framework. And I want to get, you know, let's start it off by, by Jack, just having you review worldviews that you personally have. Let's, maybe let's start like this. Let's identify one worldview that you've had for a long time. And then let's identify a worldview that is, a, is it perhaps a newer one that you're trying out per se and kind of compare and contrast how they're impacting your approach to life right now. Um, that's a good question. What is one that I've had for a long time? Um, well, while Jack's I, okay. thinking, I'm going to give the name of his podcast real quick. Yeah. Go ahead and give the an answer. And then one more time, let me, let me pluck his podcast. So that is the, the world's best podcast with Jack and Reno. And, uh, we'll be putting links and descriptions in our video below, uh, and, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, people who are, who are here, be sure to check them out as well. A lot of good stuff over on their channel. And Jack, then he's back, back, back to you on the worldview question. All right. Here is, here is one that I had for, let's, uh, easier to answer the question of like one that I'm working on. Sure. Okay. So one is, I think embarrassment is a emotion that you get that way more hinders you than the actual like consequences that the action that caused the embarrassment actually caused like your like embarrassment causes you to overestimate the negatives of a situation so for example if you're like talking to strangers you like if you walk up to a group of strangers like it and just like say i'm just gonna try to make friends with these people you can i i mean i get it i get this i get so nervous and so i've been doing this a lot right just trying to like break through this because i think it's not good to have this boundary where i'm not able to talk to strangers because i get nervous so I just go up and just say stuff like, I'm just going to let myself be embarrassed by the situation. And so essentially, I'm just training myself to be embarrassed. And so that way, I can learn my experience. Because sometimes you can't just like logically tell yourself things, you have to literally train yourself through experience. That embarrassment that I'm feeling is a limiting belief. And it do is not it's causing me to uh, miss out on opportunities of the world. Um, and so that's like one like overcoming embarrassment is a trainable worldview that you can uh, fix, but it takes, it takes time, right? It's not, that's not one you can logic yourself out of because you just can't logic yourself out of emotion because emotions are not logical, but you can practice them and like have repeat exposure, um, to reduce them. So then another one that might be uh, bigger is, you know, I grew up with the, the like a, a belief in God, like it's kind of how I was raised. Right. And then it was like, that's one that I had for the longest time. And then it was like, kind of no doubt in my mind but then i got to high school started like questioning it more um and then it's like now i don't necessarily know what my opinion is of whether or not god exists for a while i was like no way god exists i'm all science and now i'm more like like kind of spiritual about it uh so those are just some examples of different worldviews that affect my day-to-day -day decision making because if you give up god too it's like how do you determine what's right and wrong in the world well, that's a fucking hard question to ask. And so that's why I think Christianity is a good worldview because it helps you determine what's right and wrong. And we need kind of, we need guidelines for the individual for that to some degree. Hopefully that answered the question. All right. That was a great answer. And in fact, I think ties in with something that I know Don and I have talked about as well, which is that worldview actually is super important and it matters how you view things and it matters frameworks that you put in place for for analyzing the world i mean just a one world view that i know joe and i go back and forth on a, a bunch that we both try to apply is the scott adams persuasion filter that <laughs> kind of behind this facade of a logical world is actually all of these persuasions and biases that are that are impacting our behavior and it's one that we're not really taught about we have to kind of learn on our own 
you have to kind of stumble into it. I don't, you know, you have to like stumble into like a Scott Adams book or into like a CLD book on influence or something. And all of a sudden you're reading and you're like, well, I would have really haven't liked to have uh, learned about this maybe in high school or something, because knowing that as people we are in, in, in a sense, I view it as we're, we're basically incomplete in that, you know, we, we, we have these mechanisms in us that are not well understood and that are even less under our control but that nonetheless have these huge implications for how we behave, especially in social settings that we all should pay more attention to. I like that you mentioned the persuasion filter, because that is one of the, that is, that's one of the biggest, um, most impactful ideas that's come into my life in the last like year or so. Uh, cause when you look at, when you look at things to this persuasion filter, which is basically like that you aren't, necessarily deciding to be persuaded persuaded it's actually something that's kind of happening to you more so than you are participating in it and then you realize oh shit there's buttons i can push to do this with other people right right and and you can do it with yourself um but, uh, so for example uh i like recently with the <laughs> with the pre well well Scott Adams talks about this, but pairing things, right? So you pair something really good with something that maybe is like mediocre, but you start to associate the mediocre thing with a really good thing and it becomes really good. So recently I've been helping out my aunt uncle by taking their dog down, like playing fetch with it. So not a very, it's not very good at fetch. You have to bring two balls and then you throw the ball and then the dog chases after it. And then you chase after the dog and then you throw the second ball back the other way. And then you ch chase the dog again. So it doesn't get the come back part. So you have to play fetch with the dog essentially. Right. So I'm also been playing, I'm also chasing it. Uh, so I hated that doing that, but then I was like, well, I'm doing this every day at like six or 7 PM. What if I just like smoked a bowl every time before I went out <laughs> with the dog? Cause I like smoking weed. And so that, and then it started like, <laughs> that's how it started out. Now I just like doing the activity and I don't even smoke the bowl before I go a lot of the time. But the weed, but the it dog? like tricked my brain smoke? because I was pairing with it. Right. The dog, the dog did not smoke a bowl. The dog okay, likes good. the activity no matter what. Okay, good. I want to make sure. So, but now I just like it, and I don't know why that worked. It shouldn't work. It's not logical, but I just like doing it now without the weed at all. But I just tried the pairing thing, and then it just I ended up liking the task. It doesn't make logical yeah. sense, but it works. I think, I think that's a powerful idea: linking your your vices with something more productive. Like, mm -hmm. for example, it, it's easy just to go down the rabbit hole of just drinking coffee every morning and then not doing anything productive afterwards. Like you get the dopamine hit, but you don't get any productivity out of it. So I, I know that one thing is like every time I drink coffee, which is rare nowadays, but I'll make sure that right afterwards, like as as I'm taking my first sip, the pen's moving, like I'm writing something down or I'm typing something up or I'm reading something like I'm doing something productive. And I think that's a, an awesome way to, to get rid of bad habits and slowly convert them into good habits. Absolutely. I think it's, it's great. Yeah. Have you guys yeah. heard of the uh, Chinese finger trap thing for if you like got advice that you're trying to quit? This well, works great. Yeah. This, yeah, is how, this is how, this is how, this is how I got off nicotine because everyone's wondering how like, is I, and so like, you know, Chinese finger trap, you just pull it apart. You can't do it. You got to push in in order to get it out. Okay. So with nicotine, I just, one day I said, I'm going to just give myself no rules on how much I can do. I'm just going to like throw in like three pouches at once and just let myself buzz like a motherfucker. I quit three days later by accident. I just was like, I'm just not gonna make any rules. I'm just gonna do it all the time. And then like, I, I just like two weeks later, I just thought, oh shit, I haven't bought a pack of Zins in two weeks. So literally right after I gave myself permit, like stop making weird rules and boundaries or feeling guilty about it. You just, it, just went forward. I did it. I did it so much in one day that I got sick of it. And then I just stopped doing it and I didn't like try to quit. I tried to do it more. And so I don't know why it worked again. These are just like kind of bit, you know, I've been unemployed for the last month. So I've been running these experiments and some of them are just like fascinating. And yeah, you just kind of, I kind of do it in my own life. And I don't know if it would work for everybody, but you don't really, I don't really need to figure out how it works for everybody. I just need to figure out how it works for me. That's a, that's a good thing to kind of focus on for a moment, which is you're right. It doesn't have to work for everybody. It just has to work for you. 
And it doesn't have to make um, sense either. <laughs> and, and that's also true. And you can arrive at good answers for bad reasons and, and, and bad reasons for, or and bad answers for good reasons. Uh, I really like that. I want to, we, we probably need to wrap up in about 10 minutes, but I want to, I want to focus on kind of this idea of connecting worldview now to outcome. So we've, we, we've talked about outcomes, you know, and about, you know, how different groups make money. Now we've talked about worldviews. I want to work on bringing them together. And I want to specifically talk about how your worldview impacts how you pursue the future. Um, I just watched a really good lecture, a really good interview uh, from Peter Thiel, who kind of his, you know, zero to one uh, paradigm involves a matrix where you have four quadrants and you basically have two, you know, you have two levels. You have optimism and pessimism, and then you have determinant and indeterminate. And, you know, kind of his, his view is that, you know, where you want to be is you want to be in a determinate, optimistic future. You want a vision of the world that is under our control, that we can determine through our behavior, and that you also want to be optimistic about that future as well. And I, I find that fairly persuasive myself, but I, I, I don't want to put that on you per, per se. I kind of wanted you to, you know, using some of the worldviews that you just now talked about, connect that to your vision of the future and how you as an individual are working towards that future. That is an outstanding question. <laughs> this is, this is, that was good. And I also appreciate Jimmy that you're keeping me on track because I am the most scatterbrained person ever. And I just like jump from idea to idea, like all over the place. No, I, I think this has been, uh, again, uh, the, uh, that's, uh, that's a heavy question. You know, take some time for it. No, I, I, I've got, I have, I, oh, I think I have an answer. Never mind. Fire away. Fire away. So basically, so you've got this determinant versus indeterminate. That's something I think about a lot. And I have been observing myself for the last month. That's the right way to put it, right? Like I've just been, if I don't really feel like if I'm not really putting in any inputs and just like letting myself go through the day with what I want to do, with how I want to be productive, what are the actions, what are the actions I'm taking? What are the energy levels I have during the day at any given time? Uh, how productive am I being? Where are my anxiety levels at? And so I've kind of been taking this last month to just observe that, right? And then like making very clear, deliberate choices, some like sometimes during the day to try to like change it. And so one thing I noticed is it's really hard for me to just change my habits. And it, I, it's like, for example, uh, uh, getting out of bed early, right? Like that's a really hard habit for me to change when I don't have something that I like, need to get up for. And it's not something that I can change by just like forcing myself to do it, right? You can't be a slave and a tyrant at the same time. So it's like it, my, the willpower thing in the morning, there's, I have almost none of it when I'm tired and don't want to get out of bed. It's next to zero. So it's like, that's a, some, somewhere I notice where it feels like my future is kind of indeterminate, at least in that moment. Hmm. So then I was, so then I try to think, okay, how do I change this from making the decision happening from in this moment when I'm waking up to bed to like having external factors that will help me get out of bed. And so like one way to do that is if you have a job and you have a, like a social obligation to be somewhere in the morning, that makes it way easier to get out of bed. Or like another time that I've never failed to get out of bed is if I have an early flight, I always get out of bed for that. Right. And it's the same thing, right? Like it's just as difficult to get out of bed for the flight as it is. Like normally there's just way higher incentive to do it. So it's like, I, what I notice is you can adjust the incentives in your day to make these things easier and like the, and your hat and have your habits easier. Like pairing is a great one because it can make a task that you did not look forward to. You can start looking forward to it. And then just psychologically, that's just going to make you so much more likely to just perform that task. And when I actually do it, if it's something productive, like the dog taking the dog, it's like, I'm not like grudgingly taking the dog down there. I'm like, Oh fuck. Yeah. It's time to take the dog today. <laughs> so it's, so I notice it that it's like, when I'm changing my day-to-day -day habits, it's not happening in the moment. It's happening when I like kind of re-architecture the structure of my day and my, um, how I'm viewing things in life and, and taking advantage of things that I already know I like and putting those in the day. Um, and then like Joe said, you know, if you take your coffee and get the dopey hit and don't do anything, then that's like, that's just a bad habit for the coffee. But if you take your coffee and every single time you take coffee, you go, oh, coffee leads to writing an email or something like that. Like every time I drink, drink, drink coffee, I'm just going to get my laptop going and start working. It's like now you've created a, a productive scenario uh, from that. And so I don't think it's something that's made in the moment. I think you have to 
architecture it at a at a at a bigger scale and step back from it is my observation uh, real quick, Jack, uh, you were talking about how it's a lot easier to get out of bed when you have something to do or some obligation. Uh, this reminds me of something you told me before about uh, being hungover and how um, hangovers almost don't exist when you have an obligation that day. Like if you don't have anything to do the next day and you wake up and you just feel like shit, like your head hurts, and you feel sick and whatever. Like, yeah, you're not you're going to have a very unproductive day. But I mean, if you got a tea time at like 9 a.m. the next day or something like that, like yeah, you're going to make it there. You're, you're going to you make there. it. You do it. Yeah. It it's, yeah. it's, it's like, it's like for sure. Like to our last weekend, we, we were out late and I was, it was like two, three at home. And I was supposed to go to the mountain the next day. I woke up at 8 AM, just like my whole body hurting. And I just drove two hours to the mountain. And by the time I got there, I was just feeling great and a good mood and snowboarded for four hours, but it was because I was so excited to snowboard. There was no physical yeah. pain that was going to stop me. <laughs> Yeah, and I remember that you you FaceTimed me at like 9 a.m. as you're going to the mountain. And I'm <laughs> laying in bed, hardly alive. Yeah, <laughs> I that is uh, I I I really like that Jack. I uh, hangover part. No, no, I'm kidding. I uh, <laughs> I, I like getting people on a track of believing that the future is both optimistic, meaning that it will improve, generally defined, improved, and then also that it's in our control, that it's determined, that we we create in a sense, the future that we want. And when I, when I look at, you know, kind of the message that you were laying out today about worldviews and about structuring your, your, your life to make money, to be financially independent. I think all, everything you're saying right now fits in that quadrant. It fits in the paradigm of the future can mm-hmm. be, good, but it is in our control. And in a sense, we have to make it that way. And, uh, that is a worldview that I am myself trying to implement. I think this podcast is kind of, you know, trying to be a part of that um, as well. But I, I, I think, you know, we hear a lot about, you know, culture war and everything else. To, to me, that is, that is the war. The war is getting people to believe that the future can be improved, but at the same time, getting us to believe that that improvement is in a sense, our responsibility. It will not happen on its own. It will not happen through some unguiding force. It requires people working as individuals towards building that better future. One, one like two sentence way to phrase it that it's that I've been kind of saying to myself a lot is that I think everyone should say is, is the world doesn't happen to you. You happen to the world. Yeah. I, it's, I agree. It's just right. You're, and if you look around almost every single thing around you is some, is because of some human force on the world. And if you're sitting in your own room right now, most of that force is you. <laughs> I completely agree. Um, Jack, I'm, I want to I want to wrap this up. I want to I want to end on that note. I, before we get out of here, though, I want to give your podcast one more time. I want everybody who's watching you here to go and, and find this podcast. Subscribe. Uh, it is the world. Smash that like button. button. Smash that like button. Smash the- that likes button. Hit subscribe. Very yes, yes. Do all of those things. And the name of the podcast is the world's best podcast with Jack and Reno. Jack. I want to thank you for being here. I think this went extremely well. I, everything you said, I, I basically agree with. And I think it's, I, I think you are hitting on themes that are going to only become more important as we navigate from the world that we are in now towards the world of the future. I hope that we choose the path of optimism and determinism. And I hope that we use the tools you discussed today to make that possible. But we must wrap this up. So until next time, everybody, I am Jimmy Hackett signing off for Joseph Stanford saying ciao.